and the two little princes. One of the greatest difficulties of the opening of the second front was that of supply. The enormous problem of supplying and reinforcing our men through inadequate harbors was one that had to be overcome. And it was overcome, as we all know. Huge prefabricated harbors solved the problem, each providing accommodation equal to Dover. These pictures, taken as the huge armada of ships and harbor installations prepared to set out, give some idea of the size of the undertaking. What a target for submarines and the Luftwaffe, if they'd been able to get to grips. Only six days after the landings in Normandy, the armada started. But even before these pictures were taken, work had begun on the other side. Obsolete merchantmen and warships had been sunk to form additional breakwaters. Our air cover was complete. The German air force was powerless to interfere. Here again, we can get some idea of the size of the job from aerial pictures taken when the fleet reached the French coast. Every cassoon or caisson, every block ship, in fact, every smallest component had its appointed place in this tremendous task. The huge concrete cassoons, each mounting their own anti-aircraft guns with 20 tons of ammunition, arriving on D-Day plus six, were maneuvered into position by tugs and sunk. By D-Day plus 12, more than half the cassoons were already in place. They, together with the block ships, formed the outer breakwater of the harbor. The next job was the construction of the piers. This consisted of a steel roadway built on a number of bridge sections with flexible joints between to allow for the rise and fall of the tide. The sections were mounted on pontoons of steel or concrete designed to rest on the seabed when the water receded. The piers give direct access to the shore for unloading even the heaviest equipment. The pier head, too, was constructed in sections, some at Scottish ports. These spud pier heads, connected to the shore by the roadway, were ready equipped with derricks and unloading gear when they arrived. With the fixing of the spuds into position, the port was virtually completed. Almost immediately, supplies and equipment of all kinds were rolling ashore. Jeeps, lorries, tanks, and all the other impedimenta of modern war. The design includes movable ramps by which light equipment, such as jeeps and lorries, can be driven straight off the top decks of the landing craft, while at the same time, tanks and other heavy equipment can be landed from the lower portion directly onto the pierhead. Two harbors had been planned. Everything was well underway when the worst June storm in history broke along the Normandy coast. One of the harbors was badly damaged, work was suspended, and material and labor were diverted to the other. Certainly the Mulberry represents one of the greatest engineering triumphs of the war. But it's more than that, it's a great achievement by the men who designed it and the 8,000 who were responsible for its manufacture. To them, no less than to the men who erected it on the coast of Normandy and the men who fought, the credit is due for the liberation of the continent.